This week on the Ritual Misery Podcast, we're going to go surfing around something. We're going to go sur- can't We're surfing? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, we're going to go surfing with Christoph Zajac Dinnick. Oh, shit. That's right. We're surfing. Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 280 for Sunday, the 21st of March, 2021. This is show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos, that's Kent, and we have a guest as soon as I can get him on the screen because I suck at life. Um, yeah, what's going on, man? Um, yes, we've got Christoph Zajac Denek back with us for the second time, and I'm so excited to talk to him. What's uh, up, everybody? There we go. Do we, do, do, do we have the, the, the tech things worked out? Yeah, 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 yeah. <gasps> look, 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 man, look. <laughs> I got so, no time for you I, and your tech troubles. <laughs> <laughs> My tech troubles, right, right. How are you doing, Christoph? Oh, I'm just fine. It's another beautiful Sunday. I'm stressed out a little bit, but I'm doing good. Well, hopefully yeah. you can relax for the next hour while we talk about something that you're passionate about. Um, man, so around here, it's been um, it's been uh, an interesting couple of days. Uh, Steph got her first uh, dose of the COVID vaccine on yep. Friday, and I got my second dose of the COVID vaccine on Friday. Um, I can uh, I can report. That opposite to what I've been told, the second dose was uh, less of a big deal to me. Really? Um, the, with the first, do- yeah, with the first dose, I had extreme arm pain and soreness for like three or four days, and just wiped out, exhausted the next day after hmm. the shot. Damn. Um, this time, I've got mild arm pain, and um, I was pretty exhausted yesterday. Uh, so the day after. Uh, but I'm feeling fantastic today. Like no issues today. My arm is only just a little bit sore right at the injection site, and that's and that's it. Now, so, did, did you get it in your dominant arm or your your non-dominant arm? Non non-dominant, of course. Okay, I I've gotten my first one, and I got it in my dominant arm, and it was sore for about a day, but it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It didn't which defer. Ver- which version? Which version did you? Get? Uh, the Moderna. Hmm. Okay, that's the one I got. Yeah. So w- within 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 I'd say the second day after my arm felt fine and it didn't inhibit me in any way shape or form, so did, I was good to go. Did you uh did you have any any other symptoms? Fever, um fatigue, any of that sort of stuff? Um for a little while there I was a raging asshole, but I think that was just me. <laughs> I don't think that had anything to do with the so Probably not. <laughs> yeah, uh, Christoph, have you uh, have you had the opportunity to do the vaccine yet? No, I haven't, um, and I really want to. And I've like everything in my life. There's a little snafu that goes along with anything that I try to do. Um, I called up the I called up to make an appointment, mm-hmm. and dwarfism is not an acceptable disability for moving in front of the line. Um, mm-hmm. One thing that go that can go along with cartilage hair hypoplasia is uh, compromised immunity. So uh, it's really fun that it's not included at all. So I decided, well, why don't I call my doctor and get a note? I saw my doctor two months ago because I cracked a rib doing something really stupid in my kitchen. So <laughs> I call up my doctor. And I said, hey, doctor that I've seen for nine years, can I get a note that says this patient has dwarfism, potentially immune, is potentially immunocompromised. Let's get him a vaccine. They said, well, you can set up a telehealth visit or you can come in for an appointment and we'll charge you for an appointment so you can get a note to go get a vaccine. And I live an hour and a half away. And again, let me remind you, two months ago, cracked a rib, had a telehealth visit. They've also seen me for nine years. They know I have dwarfism and still won't give me a note without paying them. I couldn't believe it. I was, this is insane. So apparently I now have a fake job at a food service place in <laughs> LA 
and I am now an essential food worker. So I'm going to use that note to get my vaccine. Oh my so, so, so th- yeah. I, I'll, I'll be honest. This would bother me. Any other situation, this would bother me, except in California, they have so many doses that they are like they, Dodger Stadium the other day had like 13,000 doses that didn't get used because not enough people qualified to show up. Like, really? California is flowing with them, but they're still being too restrictive for their supply. Like their supply is out. Their, their, their supply is out demand or out uh, outnumbering their their schedule. So they need to open the schedule up more and they're just not. And yeah. Yeah. It's insane. I, I called another place because a couple of weeks ago I got hired to work on a music video playing drums and I had to have a COVID test before I could arrive on set. Mm-hmm. And so I called that place a week after I got the COVID test and I said, Hey, I was really stupid. I should have just asked you guys if I could have gotten the vaccine while I was here. And again, same thing. What is your disability? What's your reason? Are you all of these things? And I'm like, well, I have cartilage or hypoplasia. They're like, yeah, no, you don't. We don't know what that is. Um, (laughs) And uh, just like I said, well, can I show up and wait around for six hours and maybe get one of the leftover doses? And they're like, well, you can try to do that, but you never know. It's just like, what the heck? This is insane. I just want to get vaccinated and not be worried about this yeah alaska opened it up to everyone 16 and over and they had a um a mass vaccination event at the arena in anchorage and apparently the lines were so long you know it was a drive through event so you didn't have to get out of your car you basically just showed id they wrote down your information gave you the shot give you a little vax card and you went about your day and that is so surprising here in a state where people refuse to wear masks um, mm-hmm. but it's whatever. Like, I, I'm just glad they've opened it up. And, um, the VA here was one of the first places to start cranking it out. Um, and as soon as the, the 15 and under people can get their vaccinations, all my kids will be hidden in their like stat. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's just, it's amazing that a state like Alaska, you know, it, it, the, the doses are supposed to be going out proportionally. California, the state of Alaska, the entire state has a third the population of downtown L.A. Mm-hmm. You know? That's insane. Yep. Like That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, I just want everybody to get vaccinated and get on with their day. Like, that's what, that's what I want. Just yeah. Get vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I do have... I kind of have a preference that I would rather have just the one shot and not have to worry about going back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is, that is something that I I would rather do. But at this point I'm into whatever, let's do it. Let's get it over with. But, but that's kind of like, Hey man, your breast stinks. You want peppermint or do you want cherry? Like, I don't care. <laughs> just give me something to cover up the breath, man. Like, or the breath, you know, like this, yeah. I, I have a preference, but I'm not going to say no to the, whatever one you have. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been working on a couple of projects. Uh, Kent, you asked me about this BLM thing that I'm doing on Wednesday. There oh, is cool. a, a thing for BLM Cleveland. They're doing a a uh, basically a, a documentary series, and they're trying to finish up their Indiegogo. And if I was really awesome, I'd have that link handy. I'm, I'll try to throw it in the show notes and, and have it here in a second. Um, but basically I'm, I'm, uh, they're doing live streams and I'm doing the, the video production for those live streams. So it's a, uh, it's actually Rich Straffolino's cousin is the one that's in charge of it. And Rich couldn't hand, couldn't do it, couldn't fit it in a schedule. So he passed it off to me and Hand, handled one thing, uh, last week and next week or yeah, Wednesday of this coming week, I will be doing a 12 hour stream thon as they finish up their Indiegogo campaign. So nice. that's pretty awesome. excited about that. That's that's really cool of you. Um, something I learned is the BLM national level doesn't filter money down to the local levels. It's a completely separate thing. So if you have, if you're, if you want to donate to the BLM cause, find your local chapter and donate there instead of the national one, because the national one is worried about lobbying and this and that and wasting all the money doing all that kind of shit where your local people are actually doing things to affect your direct community. So public service mm-hmm. announcement on that. That's something I've yeah, I learned. Tip. 
That's a really good tip. <clears throat> okay. And uh, the other thing that I've been doing this week, man, buzz out loud. Holy shit. For those yeah, so for those that don't know, yeah. Buzz don't Out know Loud. Yeah, Buzz Out Loud is a podcast that started in 2005. It ran until 2012. It was right at seven years. This podcast originally started with Tom Merritt and Molly Wood, with Veronica Beaumont on the on the uh, production side, and then she eventually joined in as a co-host as well. It cycled through a lot of different people, but essentially, Buzz Out Loud is the first podcast I ever listened to. It's the reason I got into podcasting. It's why I work with Tom Merritt now. It's the progen- progenitor of this podcast. It's why I wanted to start podcasting with Kent. And all the episodes are lost. The feed isn't available on iTunes. The, most of the episodes, like you, if you're lucky, you could find them. Uh, some of them were uploaded to archive.org, but they were locked and not available to be edited or found or anything else. And with one tweet, somebody brought up an idea. And here we are five days later. We have found, we have, we, we have acquired copies of every numbered episode. <clears throat> what I was doing last night was update. I, I built a spreadsheet with all the ID3 tag data with the, the dates, the episode numbers, the topics, all that kind of stuff. Gone through and fixed all that, made sure the number, all the numbering was correct. And there's a numbering glitch in there that's already well known. Started a Discord page, a Discord server for it. Started getting different people involved. Um, we're going to basically start restart the RSS feed, host it ourselves so that Buzz Out Loud can live in, uh, in, in posterity. And we're going to re-release them all on the original, uh, in the original order. And the plan is we're going to start with a big batch of like about 150 episodes. And the plan is that the last episode of the original run will end the two days before the 20th anniversary of the show. The 10-year reunion show being the day before the 20th anniversary show, which is in 2025. So we have some time. And then hopefully, if I can manage it, I'm not making promises, but I'm working on it. Try to get the whole crew back together um, at a, a familiar location uh, on the 20th anniversary for a special one-time event for the 20th anniversary of Buzz Out Loud. And I already, have, is awesome. I already have some people that would be key to it, it stating that they are very interested in making that happen. So, um, it's been, it's been huge. It's been a lot of data, a lot of fucking time. I spent 14 hours yesterday buried in spreadsheets, correcting ID three tags on MP3 files that haven't been listened to in years. Oh my God. Um, it's, it's a total passion project, but yeah, I'm fucking, I'm, I'm in it, man. Like I'm, this is, this is amazing. It's so cool. That's fantastic. What, what is this is totally ignorant, but I don't know. What is Buzz Out Loud? Like, what is the show? Buzz Out Loud was CNET's podcast of indeterminate length. It is a uh, it's a tech podcast. It started out as a weekly podcast, turned into a daily podcast uh, within just a oh. few months. Damn. And it covers all the tech topics from uh, March 30th of 2005 until... Like, like it covers there's there's special episodes about the death of Steve Jobs, you know, like there's all these different tech stories. I was listening to a few just to get the numbering right and make sure that, you know, that the numbering matched up and all that kind of stuff. And some of the stuff on here was was like uh, the video iPod was announced. Wow. Like it goes back. It's it's this huge archive. And the re- the real kicker is for from about episode 73 on I think it is the producers and the hosts kept great notes so there's a summary of all the topics in the ID3 tags mm, nice. which once that's published makes all of that searchable so you can go back and reference to it about the opinions of tech folks tech reporters at the time that it was happening that's super cool man that's so, um, 
Well, I was just going to say this makes me feel a lot better because that's my plan, too, is to start taking really good notes on my podcast at episode 73. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the key. Just don't take good notes. Uh, wait, and then then you can get your community together to to form a I, project like this. I'm I'm just lucky that so many of the inf- so much of the information was embedded in the file and not just a raw MP3 with no ID3 information because that's where I got most of the information. So now we're looking for people to update the wiki because it has, you know, buzztown.org is there's a wiki for it, but it's missing tons of information. All the links are broken, you know, all those things. And yeah, we're going to go through. And the idea is to, uh, over the next couple of years, just basically rebuild Buzztown and uh, get that community going and see what all people have gone and, and what has come from that podcast. You know, different people have gone on to different things as, uh, you know, inspired by that podcast to include this show. So that's so cool, man. Good, good on you for taking that, taking that on and good luck with getting all that stuff done. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, well, Hey, at least you, you've got a good team though. You've got a, a bunch of people that are helping with the project. It's not just you. Um, so yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of people that are really helping out. Um, I'm, I, I would say that I'm code director of the project. Uh, there's another, another person that's found a lot of the, the, uh, the other audio files and a lot of the videos and we're collecting pictures and all the things, all the memories from BOL. And then of course we got Tom Merritt on board, um, he, he was one, he's one of the, the founding people in, in the discord making things happen. Um, and then Sergeant Muffin, of course, the, the inimitable Sergeant Muffin is hosting a lot of the things and making, you know, the, some of the, the background stuff happened or happen. And, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. And it, it's, it's just, it's. It, it really fills my heart with joy to know that there's so many other people out there that have such fond memories of this podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, so to switch gears a little bit, um, do, awesome. do you guys, do you guys care about the DC comics movies? Like, uh, like justice league? And whatnot? <clears throat> ah, Kent. <laughs> Christoph, what, what about you? Did, did you like, um, Batman v Superman or justice league? I haven't seen them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I uh, and that's what I. I'm uh, really bad with with uh, comic characters and and comic books and those types of characters. Yeah. I I didn't watch Justice League because I heard it was horrible. Um, I did watch Superman v or Batman v Superman. I don't mm-hmm. really remember much of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course I've seen Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 84. Wonder Woman was awesome. Wonder Woman 84. If you took away (laughs) some (laughs) extremely troubling aspects of that movie, it was good. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah. You know, the whole, Um, the whole date rate thing. Did you see Aquaman Uh, though? Did you see Aquaman? I did not. Um, I, I can't watch, I can't watch Cal Drogo for too long without my wife, like insisting that I move out or go to the gym. So, uh, that's 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 hilarious. Good. Well, so so the um, the long anticipated Snyder cut of Justice League came out on Friday, Thursday, Thursday or Friday. Yeah, I think it was week. Thursday. Um, four hours long. Yeah, it's four it's hours. Four hours. It is freaking four hours, and over half of the movie is is new content that wasn't in the first movie. Right. The, and, or the you know the uh, um the theatrical Wait, so brief history Zack Snyder was directing Justice League got called yep. away because of family matters or whatever he got called away from the project yep. they brought in Joss Whedon Joss Whedon went reshot a bunch of stuff did uh change the color grading basically redid the entire movie shaped it to his vision within mm-hmm. what budget he had and then re- they released that Zack Snyder comes back in after the fans go crazy because Joss Whedon just did not do a good job, apparently. Zack Snyder comes back in and says, okay, take everything that Joss Whedon did, throw it in the bin, and we're going to reshoot uh, some things, but we're not going to use anything that, that, that wasn't originally shot by me. So it's, it's completely shot by Zack Snyder. And only about 50% of the movie that you see is made of previously seen footage. 
the other 50% yeah. of the movie is all brand new footage that was either on the floor when Joss Whedon took it or was shot after Joss Whedon left the project. Yeah. It's, so it's huge insane. undertaking. That's insane. I can't. And, and Zack Snyder didn't take any pay to, to do the Snyder cut. He, he said taking money to do this would, would taint the vision, which I don't quite get, but yeah, he just did it for free and, and, uh, put this thing out. anyway. It's it's crazy. Like we could do a whole well, maybe not with uh, with you two guys since you aren't um, DCEU uh, fans, but like I could do a whole podcast just about the Snyder Cut. Um, it is it is insane. Some things are better, some things are worse, some things are. I just don't understand why he made those decisions. Um, but I will say, just just so that I actually throw an opinion out here, one thing that I think is much much better in this version than the the Whedon version is the character of Cyborg is yeah. actually a character in the movie and actually has a story and is fleshed out. One of the things that I hated about Justice League is that they had Cyborg show up, but like nobody gave a crap about the character and it was horrible because th there was just no story there. There was nothing written for him. Well, that's what it seemed like, but Snyder actually made him into a... Um, a very interesting character and right. it, and and he shines in the Snyder cut. So it, I, I, that's, that's my one positive thing I'm going to say. I, I, I it, it, cool. from what I understand, it's almost like cyborg was only in the Joss Whedon cut because he was required to be according to actors guild rules is how it seems like he was in there just enough to qualify for the actors guild to keep them off, yep. off the movies back. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't know all the politics behind that, but it 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 was stupid. I I hated the the cyborg character in in Whedon's cut, but I love the cyborg character in in um, I'm Andrew's version. I'm gonna watch this, but I'm gonna do it in the opposite order that most other people do it. I'm gonna go ahead and watch the Snyder cut first, and then the ah. Whedon version. And this is something we discussed on DTNS because yeah, people that, that have had cool. people that have seen the Whedon version are going in with different expectations than. If you haven't seen it, so I'm going to go in, watch the Snyder cut, the uh, his quote unquote original vision, and mm. then going to go through and see what Whedon did to it. So well, once I do that, we'll have to compare. Now that's six hours of video, so it might be a couple weeks, but we'll have to compare compare notes in, in how we process the movies differently. Oh hell yeah! So is the, topic. Hell yeah! Is the Whedon cut two hours? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think it's a little over two hours. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing that they put out a four hour. That's incredible. The yeah. only thing that I can like really contribute sort of is uh, I did play Puck in a Deadpool music video or Deadpool Deadpool musical like revival. They like they wrote all these songs, all these Disney themed uh, Disney inspired songs around Deadpool and they had they got a custom a custom uh, puck outfit for me, and I did get to play puck <laughs> a, among that a is... bunch of other a bunch a bunch of other uh, comic book heroes. They're That's all awesome. in there. That's awesome. That is freaking cool. It was fun. Um, it's about I think that it's, Amos. I think it's time to hit that button over there. Yeah, that's. Well, let me talk about something for about ten seconds. Okay. Um, so t today's main topic is going to be surfing and, uh, we'll get into, um, why that's going to be our main topic here in a little bit. But before we do that, uh, we are going to play a game that's inspired by our main topic. And you might hear the music. What time is it? Ken. He's all powerful. He's extraordinary. A genius. Game. I cannot contain myself. Ken's game. Presented by Stephen Cogswell. Woo! So here's the thing. I have this magical board and I can turn sounds on and off and channels on and off. And for different shows, I have to have different sounds that are definitely not playing. And you'd think that would be a problem, but I have all these presets over here that I can have remember all the settings for each of those shows. I just don't fucking use them because I'm not that smart. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Why? Uh, today's, game, today's game is called, Do You Even Surf, Bro? And uh, so 
Christoph is a is a big surfer, <laughs> and he's also a musical guy. So I combine. Wait, what did I miss? What happened? I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> St- stuff is off the rails at the moment. <laughs> All right, so for the for the audio listeners, Amos is absolutely losing his mind right now, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> what the hell happened? <laughs> you, you said you, you said the name of today's game is "Do you even surf, bro?" And then Christoph said, "Bro." Like, like, like you'd used the wrong word. <laughs> That's right. I did fuck that up. Okay. Uh, take no. two. Do you even surf, bro? <laughs> oh my god! This is the best ever. <laughs> All right. So, anyway. The uh, the game is combining surfing and music, so I'm going to give you ten song titles, and you're going to tell me if it was a Beach Boys song or not. Cool. How familiar are you are you guys with the Beach Boys music? Um, I'm fairly comfortable with it. For I think maybe. Yeah, Christoph. What about you? Oh, I'm familiar with it, but I'm terrible with song titles um specifically led zeppelin i don't know the names of any led zeppelin songs but i could play i can play more led zeppelin songs than i know the names to. i i don't nice. think they did either to be honest uh yeah right right yeah. <laughs> thank Depending you on, uh, they don't what era they have a song what was it dear maker like what what does yeah. that even mean and why is it associated with some dude screaming his fucking head off? Like I don't understand. I love the song. <laughs> Name just doesn't make any sense. But anyway. <clears throat> All right, Christoph, you're you're the guest. Do you want to go first or second? I'll go first cuz I believe I went second last time. Okay. Yeah, I think you did. Okay. All right. Um uh, again, you're going to tell me is this a Beach Boys song? Yes or no? Okay. Surfer Girl. Yes, that is a Beach Boys song. You are correct. It is. Amos, Surf City. Um, Surf City. That'd be Surf City USA, wouldn't it? No, it would be called Surf City. Oh, then I'm going to say no. <laughs> you're going to say no. Well, good, because you're correct. It's Jan and Dean that came out with Surf City. All right. Next one for you, Christoph, is Catch a Wave. Yes, that is a Beach Boys song. That's correct. That is correct. All right, Amos. Okay. Surfing USA. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, that is correct. All right. Uh, back over to you, Christoph. Surfing Dan. Oh, sorry. Surfer Dan. Surfer Dan. No, that is not a Beach Boys song. Wasn't that a skater? I think it was like a late 80s skater. Surfer Dan. No, that was uh, Steely Dan. There's music I didn't listen to. Got it. Steely okay. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Surfer Dan is by the Turtles. Nice. Okay. All right, Amos. Surfing Bird. Surfing Bird. This sounds like a meal at Long John Silver's. <laughs> like, uh, bird. No, I, I didn't. That, I don't. I, no, that's got it. No, that that seriously sounds like a meal at Long John Silver's. I'm gonna say no. <laughs> so anybody, anybody that's familiar with um, with Family Guy uh, should know this song, Surfing Bird, by the Trash Men. You are correct. It's not a Beach Boy song. This is the one that's like bird, 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 bird. Yeah, that's yeah. called Surfing Bird. Surfing bird. Yeah. Uh, no, that's the oh. song that Peter gets his ass kicked to. So, that's that's how, that's the official name of that so song now. <laughs> so so the interesting thing about Surfing Bird. So there was two different songs. There, there was uh, uh, I think it's called Bird is the Word, and then there was Papa Umu Umau Mau by two completely different artists that came out like you know roughly the same time. And the Trashmen 
took the two songs and combined them to make a new song called Surfing Bird. And uh, anyway, uh, it's a uh, little bit of trivia there. That, that That's all before the DMCA. I, I, I promise you that. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, over to you, Christoph. Surfing Safari. That is a Beach Boys song. Yes, it, it is. It is indeed. All right, Amos, wipe out. Uh, it is a song. It is not a Beach Boy song. <laughs> that is correct. It is by the Surfaris. By the Surfaris? Yep. Surfaris. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I just want to make sure I, I heard that correct. Yeah. <gasps> by, by the All way, right, Chris- uh, Christoph, can you play wipe out on the drums? Yeah. I mean, who can't? Uh, so here's the thing, Kent. That's one of those songs that it sounds simple. It it actually sounds like you're just basically banging some toms to to a beat, but yeah. it's got some tricky little half steps in there and mm-hmm. stuff like that. That once once you once someone explains to you what they are, like you listen to you know one of those professional people, uh, you know, talk about here's where here's where you have that time change and here's where you have the 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 half step and things like that. Then you listen to it again. You're like, oh my god, I didn't even hear that shit before. I just heard a rumble of toms. Yeah. It's it's one it just it sounds it's it's one of those things that's so elegant. It sounds simple. Yeah, mm-hmm. they did a good job with it. <clears throat> All right, Christoph, your next one, surfing. Yes, that is a Beach Boys song. It is indeed. And uh, Brian Wilson hated that song. That was one of their earliest <clears throat> songs, and he absolutely hated it. All right, Amos, your Bri- next one. Brian Wilson didn't deserve that song. <laughs> <laughs> your, your next one and the last one of the game, Amos, uh-oh, is uh-oh. Surf Rider. Surf Rider. Surf Rider. trying to gamify this here uh so do, 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 do. um it, that didn't sound uh, that sounds more like a band than a song so i'm gonna say no okay um that song is by the lively ones you guys got a hundred percent you guys beat the hell out of the d that means i get to play this now right Bob, tell them what they've done. You beat the D. Back to you, Daniel. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you guys got all of those right. I'm surprised because so many of these songs, sound the song titles sound the same. It's either Surfing This or Surfer That or... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, good job. Uh, also, this is what this is this is this is what we get for having a squids mixtape in the chat room. <laughs> oh yeah, were you cheating? <laughs> oh, yeah. Only on, only on like one or two. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hey, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. <laughs> oh wow. Um, yeah. All right. So that was our game. Um, we um, we wanted to talk about surfing because. Christoph is a somewhat um, prolific surfer himself, and um, you gave me some news a few days ago, Christoph, that I kind of want to touch on, um, but I mostly just kind of want to talk about your experience with surfing and like uh, uh, like your history with it and uh, where you intend to take it. But I, I you know what? I'm not even going to say. I'm, I'm going to let you announce the uh, the thing that you told me about earlier. Um, but but you know what? We'll we'll do that uh, as it comes in the conversation. When when did you start surfing, and and what what caused you to uh, uh, to want to to get into that sport? Yeah, I've been I am hopelessly addicted to surfing. Um, I think it came from <clears throat> it definitely came from skateboarding as a young kid. I always wanted to skateboard, and my friends got me into skateboarding. Friends on the block, you know, and when I was eight, I think I got my first skateboard and I would, I lived in Michigan. So you could only skateboard for five months out of the year and then hope to skateboard for the other seven months out of the year. Um, and I just always loved that culture and going to the skateboard shops was always really cool to me. I kind of started at 
in the late eighties when there was still the style of hot pink and hot yellow and hot blue colors, you know, that were all mixed in and that like weird, uh, really bright and loud, uh, style that was happening. And I still kind of love that today. <laughs> I still kind of <laughs> think that's kind of cool. But, yeah. um, I mean, in Michigan, you don't have any sort of reason to surf or have surf culture or surfboards or anything like that, especially in the, in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, surfing was not really a thing. It is a thing now in Michigan, but <clears throat> then it was not, but my family would go to Florida for spring breaks and I would just venture into surf shops and that's where they sold Thrasher magazine. And then they also had surfing magazine right next to it. Mm. And I would see the same bands advertised in Thrasher that were advertised in surfing. And I r realized this, you know, crossover between the two and it just was always so cool to me like that whole culture of skateboarding skateboarding in pools skateboarding in skate parks skateboarding on the street it was so rad to me and then once I went to Florida and I saw people surfing or I saw waves or saw posters and surf shops of people surfing amazing waves I just wanted to I wanted to try it and so I begged my mom instead of taking instead of going to the Gulf Coast, we went to the ocean one year and I rented a surfboard, didn't take lessons, didn't do anything to prepare at all. I just <laughs> hopped into the ocean, uh, I probably rented a terrible wetsuit that barely fit me and got me waterlogged. Um, but yeah, I just hopped in the ocean and I wanted to try to catch waves and see if I could stand up and just get out there. And being from Michigan, we spent a lot of time at the lakes and at the water and at the beach. So I was always comfortable in water. You know, mm. I started swimming it as a baby and surfing just seemed so, so cool. And so, yeah, how, I tried how it. Old, oh, how old were you when, when you rented that surfboard the first time? I think I was 14 or 15. Okay. Teenager. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And one of the times that I went in the ocean, um, I got caught in a rip current and didn't know I was caught in a rip current but it wasn't taking me out. It was drag. It was just like a, uh, you know, a side current, and it would drag me down. But I got into this place where I could not catch any waves. No waves were breaking, so it's deeper water, and I could not get into shore. I was exhausted from paddling. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't know why I was going down the beach as quickly as I was going down the beach. And I remember my mom, you know, was kind of after she realized I wasn't in front anymore, she just realized and started walking towards me. And I finally got in and she was super freaked out, but I was like, all right, this is still cool. I'm really scared, but this was really, really still cool. So yeah. And yeah. I've just been, you know, surfing is kind of this thing that you can never be, you can never stop learning. You always yeah. have to be present and watching and, realize that the the waves in the ocean is always going to be different no matter what if you have a perfect day uh at a point break and you're just surfing all day long those waves are going to change because of the tide because of the swell direction that's going to be coming in because of all these other factors and i just think that's so cool because it makes you want to live in the moment mm. and it forces you to live in the moment you know yeah. So where, like these days, where do you, where do you tend to surf? Are you, are you still on the East coast of Florida or where do you like to go? Uh, now that I live in California and I'm not trying to surf on Lake Michigan anymore. Um, <laughs> it just sounds so miserable. It's, uh, yeah. It's so beautiful out there, but it's like the worst washing machine, uh, sensation ever. It's just, <laughs> Windy and bumpy, and I mean, I've seen incredible waves on Lake Michigan, but um, I haven't had the right timing to to find uh, to be out there at the right time. But yeah, I'm in Southern California now, so I surf in in LA. I go to Malibu, I go to Ventura, and um, mostly point breaks. Sometimes I surf some beach breaks, which are really fun. Those are totally different. So a point break, it's the wave is all is. Uh, the shape of the wave is determined by the bathymetry, the bottom of the ocean. And so when it's rocky, that 
doesn't change, those rocks stay in place, and then the swell can come and hit the hit the rocks pretty much as uniform as it possibly can. And that's why the wave maintains its shape at rocky point breaks more than it does, say, at a beach break, where the the sand on the bottom will get mixed around and it'll get shifted and it'll change with the tides and stuff like that. So if the bathymetry is dynamic and changing like sand, then it's it's going to be dumpier sometimes. Uh, dumpy means like it's going to all crash at once and won't give you a face to ride. Whereas uh, if it's more of a rock, uh, like Malibu has a pebble, like a like a rocky pebble bottom and so that wave comes in so much more consistent and it's it stays it keeps its shape you know much better than a beach break would gotcha i'm learning all kinds of stuff i know there's so many there's so many aspects to this too you know it's and it's kind of interesting because the water doesn't change the water kind of stays in the same place when you think of a wave breaking the swell energy just kind of goes underneath the water and pushes it up. And the reason why a wave breaks like that is because the front of the wave is actually slowing down when it hits the reef and the back of the wave is actually going faster than the front of the wave. And so that catches up and that's why you have a curl. So it's forcing so the it. Back of the, wa- the back of the wave is actually breaking over the front of the wave because of the speed difference between the two. That's crazy. Mm. It's okay. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I do have a question about uh, like surf. So we, we raise in, in like a uh, Jan and Dean and stuff like that. Uh, in the, that music pretty much represents surf culture from like the sixties and seventies. How much of that, like, um, I guess mood feeling, if you will, of the community is still the same or, or how has it evolved? I guess. I think it's still in there. I feel like when I go surf Malibu and Ventura, especially when I am surfing with some dudes who've been around since the 60s, because they're still out there and they're still ripping, oh, sure. and yeah. and I have to get off waves when they're coming on a wave. <laughs> like, I got to get out of the way. Um, yeah, I, th- I think it influenced it a ton. And it's still there. There's... Uh, I don't know. That sound is so iconic and it's just kind of in the blood. And I think it, it's, it's influenced the, in, that surf, the surfaris and beach boys and um, Dick Dale, they all influenced that sound so much. And then as surfing progressed, I think it really, it took from those, but then made it like other bands, you know, like, uh, I listen to a lot of like bad religion and no effects and stuff like that. And I don't know how much bad religion surf, but they were in that whole culture there. And, um, all that punk rock that came out of that was, you know, all those bands were from the beach. They all had surfing injected into their culture and, Mm. and their surroundings. And it just, it, it kind of just fits, especially when you watch, surfing videos and you get to see these guys on really fast waves you know and there's punk rock playing in the background there's like greasy not perfect punk rock that's happening and i think it just i think it just fits and that's the way music was in the 60s too i mean music wasn't that polished thing but surf rock is fast you know and there's a lot of notes just like punk rock it's fast it's technical in a lot of ways and I think it just matches. And now, unfortunately, I can't name any of the bands, but when I watch surfing videos that are made in the last five years, it's almost like they're pulling from this psychedelic realm where they're they're kind of early. A a lot of the music is reminiscent of early Beach Boys where it's really jangly Mm -hmm. and very not perfect. Like, it's really Mm -hmm. just, like, loosey goosey stuff and harmonies are not on and guitar stuff is not on but there's this space in the music that's really wide and it just sounds really cool like the space between the drums and the guitar and stuff is just kind of floating around and i really like how that's happening now too that's awesome nice 
Um, have you um, have you considered um, going pro for surfing, or is that even uh, is is your uh, skill level even up to to that yet? My my skill level is definitely not up to being pro. However, I would love to work with a surfing company. I mean, that's come on. I'm a little person. <laughs> from Michigan in his forties. You know what I mean? Like that would be the dream of my life, man. <laughs> if a surfing company called me up and said, uh, Hey, we want to pay you to do something. I'd be like, what, <laughs> what is happening right now? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I'm not going to be a contest surfer. I watch contest surfing and Jesus, I mean, those people are, they're from another world. You know, their focus is, the, the thing about s contest surfing is it's not just go out and achieve a touchdown. You know, it's not just go out and achieve, you know, home runs. You have that aspect of it, but you are 100% by yourself in the ocean that is constantly changing and might not even give you a playing field. So you might not even have a way if you if say you need to score nine points out of 10 because your opponent has 9.5 or 9.01 points more than you. That math is wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Say you say you're at a point where you need to, <laughs> where you, I could, that's the thing I can never adequately describe surfing, uh, how, how the points work, but say you need to get a nine point wave and you have to wait until Bef you know, you only have so much time out there. The clock is going to run out. And if the ocean doesn't give you a wave to ride on, you can't even get a playing field to achieve that point. Yeah. And that's the thing that's, it's such a mental game on top of being such a physical game. And you're not even on a team. You have no one else to help you out. You have no one else mm -hmm. to like, all right, you pick up this one because I, it didn't come for me. It's like, no, you are just solo all the time. <clears throat> and I think it's, that's why I think surfing is just such an incredible sport. And I do like the way that contest surfing is set up because the, the drama in there is so heavy. It's so thick. I've seen so many heats won when, like, after the buzzer, you know, like somebody catches a wave with one second left and they destroy it and they, they have to wait, you know, three minutes to for the judges to score the ride, and then they actually win when they're walking up the beach. It's crazy. It's so when you're when you're into it. I mean, it's the only sport that I pay attention to. So, it, I, I you talk to me about any other sport, and I'm just checked out. But yeah, so I, so I got a I got a question though, real quick. So it's an individual sport, right? So like you don't have a team that you know, you contribute to like the team's score or anything like that. But are there teams though? Like, like, um, a sponsor will have like a stable of surfers or like For folks sure. that train, train together, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So a sponsor might have, you know, one surfer on, on tour, or they might have 30 or 40, you know, it, mm. there, there are some really big surfing companies that sponsor multiple people. And those people often will compete against each other. But it's not necessarily like you're winning points for the team, at least as I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's because the sponsor, you, you could surf in a, a competition. You could win a competition and have zero sponsors because you can be a wild card at that certain location if somebody else drops out and not have any stickers on your surfboard, but you could still win the entire event. And that will probably get you calls for <laughs> sponsors, you oh, know, for after sure. that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're out there vying for your for yourself. In in, uh, in NASCAR, they call it coopetition. Like you have teams, <laughs> but every driver is driving for themselves. And that's a good yeah. word. I've never heard that word before. Yeah. Um, yeah and that's... and I think I think of surfing as more of a uh, a community team sport because everybody's out there on their own. But then when you're on the beach, you're still sharing tips on on the locations and the timing and what to look for and sharing yep. stories. Like, it's not like you're out there and you're just holding, Oh, I found this great spot. I'm not going to tell anybody about it ever. <laughs> it's more like I found this great spot and I'm going to tell my friends and they're eventually going to tell their friends and their friends are going to be, so it's going to, it's going to get crowded. But for the little bit of time we have, we're going to go out there and hit this point like nobody's business. 
Yeah, and also in some of these, you know, off the beaten path locations, you might have surfers rooming with other surfers that they're in competitions or heats with. And so, you know, you kind of have to have, again, another element to the whole balance of the whole thing. Like the guy that you lost the entire competition to might be living in the same house as you for that 10 days when you're at that location. <laughs> yeah. So That's it's awesome. wild. So would you, like, would you ever, like you said going pro would just be like some kind of crazy dream, but have you ever considered like actually setting a goal to enter a competition? So I did actually enter a competition, um, a year and a half ago, I entered my first competition hmm. at Malibu and <clears throat> it was an adaptive competition. So I was surfing with, um, uh, amputees and spinal cord injury victims and, um, uh, hard of sight, hard of hearing folks, just all different types of disabilities and, and situations. And I, I was in a heat with, <clears throat> excuse me, other average height folks, and they couldn't really stand on the surfboard, but they were six feet tall. So their arms were the arms of a six foot tall person. And I don't have the arms of a six foot tall person. And if you'd like to know, it's much easier for a six foot tall person's arms to catch a wave than a four foot four inch tall person to catch a wave. And so I, you know, I felt like I was a, at a disadvantage, but I was having a blast. I had so much fun being in the water with all these folks and watching them surf is so kick ass. And so I did that event. And then one of the uh, people at the event said, you should come down next weekend to Oceanside. We're having a huge event. And it was, it was the organizer. And he said, I will put together um, a short stature division because there's another short statured mm. individual who's going to come surf and it'll just be the two of you. And if you get first or second, you'll win money. So you should come <laughs> and come down and do it. And I'm like, well, damn, I got to do this. And this is, this is super rad. And I know, I knew the other surfer. Uh, I've actually met him a couple of times beforehand, although I'd never surfed with him before. So yeah, I went down to Oceanside and I surfed and there were 90 adaptive surfers. It was insane. They had 80 volunteers from San Diego on the beach helping everybody out. Like they had these water wheelchairs to wheel people over to where oh, they, wow. where they would take them and put them on their boards. And then they had assistance in the water to help people get into the waves. I mean, there's some triple amputees who are surfing and they're just holding on to a handle on the board and like riding a six foot wave. Come on. That is so cool. <laughs> it was so rad to see these people out there. And, um, and yeah, so I surfed two heats with, uh, against my buddy Ryan and I ended up winning. I won my division in, in the competition and, you know, I won some money and it was awesome. And I mean, Ryan is a badass surfer. He's so, he's so good. He was riding a much smaller board than I was, which is a lot more difficult, um, in situations, especially in the conditions that we were in. But, you know, it, it was, it was about the whole experience. That's what was so cool. I made so many friends. I met so many awesome people. I saw so many cool waves and it was, it, it was just one of the most badass weekends ever. I almost didn't surf because it was really gnarly and it, it was next to a pier and people were like oh. getting swept through the pier. Oh God. Like, yeah. That's I'm scary. Like, yeah. I don't know that I want to go in this water. This is crazy. How do I get myself out of this? <laughs> but, um, you know, I did it and, uh, I mean, what a time it was, it was so cool just to, just to be there in the community and have that experience. And again, I'm from Michigan. Damn it. I won a <laughs> surfing competition. This is crazy. Uh, let us know when they have a, uh, a, a semi geriatric, um, uh, novice division, uh, and and it's all expenses paid, and me and Kent might go out there and uh, <laughs> right, yeah, and Yo, and try our hey, hand. If you guys, you guys want to come to California, I'll teach you to surf. Uh, oh, that shit! I might take you up on that. that. Kent right. would take you up on that. I don't deal so well do with uh, my anxiety over natural water. <laughs> right. I, I understand. Once I can no longer touch the bottom, I'm kind of over it. Um, you can still touch the bottom. I can't touch the bottom, but you might be able to. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not surfing 
where I surf, I'm not out there surfing in crazy, crazy waves. You know, I'm totally down with small waves. I do like bigger waves when they happen. Um, I'm a little out of shape at the moment, so I need uh, need to get back into it. But yeah, Kent, come on out. Let's yeah, get Kent, Amos yeah. out there. Too. Let, let's let's trick Amos into coming to Southern right. California for, <laughs> right, yeah. for a live in person show on the beach with surfboards and a wetsuit. And whoops, it's we just, just for went decoration, into... Amos. It's just the theme. <laughs> you don't have to get in the water. <laughs> come on, bro. <sighs> I'm I'm down for that. Um, right. cool. So what's up? Uh, Chris, what's what's the future hold for you in surfing? Um, well, I want to keep doing it, and surfing has rewarded me uh, in a lot of ways because of consistency. When I was mostly working as an actor, uh, meaning I wasn't working all that much, um, I would go to the beach a lot and surf, and. I got better because of it and because of that um, built up the confidence and kind of met some people and I've actually shot a documentary about myself with some producers about my life and surfing and dwarfism and my podcast and so I don't know what's next. I really hope that there's something else that comes from this you know, having this elevated to a larger stage, it's not to show everybody that I'm whatever kind of surfer, but it's to show people that, first of all, people with dwarfism can and do all of these different types of things, and they should be taken seriously as such. And then also to mm -hmm. just inspire people that it doesn't matter what you do, you know, you can do everything that you want to do and don't let your body or you know other other roadblocks that might seem like might seem to stifle your ability you know you can you can still do stuff and it's important to get yourself out there and get your body moving and it's good for your brain and your your soul and your body yeah, so absolutely. two things Christoph. one we need to get you in touch with allison sheridan that's that's a must, and I'll. She she loves doing podcast. She has a, she has several podcasts actually, and she loves talking about uh, the ways that technology is ignoring or enabling people with different abilities than you know non non average abilityed persons. Um, yeah. Whether that's sight or height or whatever, she loves tackling that subject. It's a it's a passion of hers. Um, and two, have you ever uh, have you ever surfed in Guatemala City? I have not surfed in Guatemala City. No. I don't know that you could surf in Guatemala City. Is it on the <clears> beach? <throat> I should have done my research. Um, <laughs> it's time for this, though. One city. One city. One forecast. One forecast. One word. It's Ritual Miseries. One word weather. Brought to you by Mark Jelinek and his What Is It About the Weather podcast. Today's city is Guatemala City in Guatemala. It is 60 degrees. It's sunny. No. You, no? No. <laughs> what What do you look at during these shows, man? Because you're not looking at the show notes that I've got in front of you. You don't watch the video to see when other people are oh. talking. Oh, my bad. Like It's not sunny. <laughs> Best co-host ever. <laughs> this is amazing. We've done this segment exactly twice, and we've screwed it up both times. I love it. He says we. Um, Christoph, where can people find you and all the things that you're getting involved in, man? Um, yeah, you can find my podcast, which I'm very involved in. It is I'm Kind of a Big Deal, and you can find it on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to your podcasts and then find me on instagram a big or no instagram is big deal pod there's no a in front of it big deal pod on instagram <laughs> yeah go to go to the instagram and you can see a bear outside of christoph's door oh my god it's crazy yeah. that's crazy did I, I told you that my neighbors had a huge bear last night right yeah yeah that's that is so crazy 
Yeah, that's, um, that's probably why you're moving. The the bears are, are threatening <laughs> to take over the area. He's not well, moving as much as being evicted by nature. <laughs> right. <laughs> bears are kicking you out. Man. Yeah, I got all my dried cranberries and my peanuts stowed away, so. <laughs> nice. Um, next week on this podcast, we had we have Josh Cafferty. Uh, yep. this is, uh, this is, this is interesting for a few reasons, Kent. Yeah. So Josh is actually Steph's brother mm-hmm. and, um, he has for a while now been traveling around, uh, the country going to different national parks and, um, he's coming through the area to go to white sands national park. And, uh, he's going to be on our show next week to talk about, uh, just national parks in general and like his experience with uh with visiting them that's gonna be awesome is he is he living van life um yeah well right now he's he's in a fixed location at the moment but prior to that he was van life and in the future he's gonna be va- van life so that's pretty cool i couldn't do it yeah i could do it for a while i think i don't know i depends like, on a lot of but, but I can see a version of me doing the van. I my, my stepdad had a van that we converted into like a camper. And I I can tell you, I can do van life for about a weekend. And only if there's fishing and barbecues involved. That's about sure. it. I think well, that's yeah. I think yeah. that's just a I think that's just camping. I don't think that's van life. Yeah, see? Exactly. Exactly. That's my point. It's vamping. <laughs> vamping. <laughs> <laughs> That might be something different. <laughs> you, you, there's no, there's no way of doing it good because you, you vamp. If you're vamping, that's one thing. If you like van camping, well, that's that's like a. Then you're just eating beans all the time. Like I don't that's know. What I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a bean brand. Yeah. I, don't, I don't, I don't know what the good interstitial there is. There's got to be something. Though. Oh man, I want to read out. I want to reach out to bushes and see if they'll underwrite my van. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! <laughs> Holy crap! Oh my gosh! I want to encourage people to go over to richmisery dot com and and uh, check out all of the projects that we've got going on over there. Yeah, uh, and here's more show notes that aren't correct. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, Kent! Where do you get these show notes? What? The, the, this part of the show notes is yours. No, 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 no! The whole thing is. <laughs> Oh my God! I'm hitting the music. We're live every Sunday at about 4 p.m. Pacific on DiamondClub.tv and Twitch.tv/slash Ritual Misery. Thank you for listening, for Kent, for Kristoff, for me, for you, and for the kids. Let's not forget the kids. For the kids, this has been your Ritual Misery podcast. Fucking Kent. <laughs> Kent let me write the show notes, actually. I didn't want to tell you. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh man. So that was that was fun. The uh the sounds <laughs>